Uh, my name is Anne Larry Godry. I'm the uh, executive secretary of uh, IBES. I'm truly delighted to welcome you on behalf of the co-chairs of this uh, workshop to the opening segment of the workshop on biodiversity and climate change, which is co-sponsored by IBES and IPCC. We are very honored to have the presence of the Minister of State and the State Secretary representing uh, the co-hosts uh, for this workshop, the United Kingdom and Norway. Their presence truly honors us and also underlines the, the significance uh, and the historic uh, significance uh, of this event, the first ever collaboration uh, between IBES and IPCC. As you will remember, we were to meet in London uh, back in May. We had started to make glorious plans to celebrate the event uh, properly. Uh, like many other events, we had to fall back on holding uh, this meeting uh, virtually, but there will be better days and we will do that uh, properly later. Uh, I would like to uh, first uh, invite uh, to deliver his opening uh, remarks the Right Honorable Lord Goldsmith, Minister of State for Pacific and the Environment at the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs and Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Lord Goldsmith, we are truly uh, delighted to have you uh, with us today and the floor is yours, thank you. Th thank you so much, Anne. And on the contrary, it's an honour for me to be speaking to you today. Um, as you know, we'd hoped to be able to welcome you to London way back in May, but delays caused by the pandemic also mean that the all-important biodiversity and climate conferences in Kunming and Glasgow are still ahead of us. Uh, so this workshop is very, very timely indeed. The essential synthesis that you're working on today is going to help us make this catastrophic year the catalyst for a whole decade of action that recognizes how inextricably linked these challenges really are. Uh, and of course, the work of the IPCC and the IPBES has already moved the dial. And we've seen that when highly respected scientists speak with one voice, the world listens. And especially, I think, at a time like this, the reports by the IPCC and IPBES are already being read around the globe. But they're not just being read, they're being used as a call to action in homes, in classrooms, boardrooms, parliaments, international negotiations, even elections. And I can say from my own experience that these reports have been exactly what we needed, exactly when we needed it. Uh, for all those of us who make the case day in, day out for more ambitious, more effective solutions to the biggest challenges that we face. And drawing those threads together is surely going to make that case unarguable, which of course, it absolutely already is. Without meaningful action, the world is on course for a dangerous level of warming and the implications of that are almost unfathomable. At the same time, we're destroying life on earth. Each minute we lose around 30 football pitches worth of tropical forests. We've seen populations of key species decline by almost 70% since 1970, which is wouldn't even qualify as a nanosecond from an evolutionary point of view. And the ocean environment is being stripped of life just as quickly. For the billions of people who depend most directly on nature, the fish in the sea, the free services uh, provided by forests and other ecosystems, these trends are devastating. But ultimately, of course, we all depend on the health of the planet. So for people and the planet, reversing this uh, grim trajectory is the principal challenge of our age. And science has shown that we cannot do so without harnessing the awesome power of nature itself. Simply, there's no pathway to tackling climate change or poverty or biodiversity loss that does not involve nature. Nature-based solutions like forests, mangroves, peatlands could provide a third of the cost-effective climate mitigation required by 2030 while helping species recover and helping communities to adapt to an inevitably changing world. But despite that huge contribution, nature-based solutions still receive around 3% of international climate finance. So as presidents of the next UN climate conference, COP26, the UK is urging countries to ramp up their ambitions and put nature at the heart of their response. Here in the UK, uh, we've committed to doubling our, our, climate, our international climate finance and to using much of that uplift to investing in nature. And we're encouraging other countries to do similarly. 
but we won't succeed with public money alone. So we need also to find ways to shift the incentives that are driving degradation. If you consider that the top 50 food producing countries pay out every year $700 billion in support for often destructive land use, or making those payments conditional upon responsible land management, as we're beginning to do here in the UK, could tip the market in favor of sustainability. Um, around 80% of global deforestation is driven by agriculture, and around half of that is illegal. So in the UK, we've also introduced a new law preventing big business importing commodities that, is, that are grown on illegally cleared land. And we're working to build an alliance of countries, North, South, East, West, producer, consumer, all committed to cleaning up global commodity supply chains. And again, if we succeed, we could flip the market in favor of keeping forests and ecosystems alive. And we need massive efforts around ocean protection too. Last year, we launched the Global Ocean Alliance of Countries committed to protecting at least 30% of the world's ocean by 2030. And we have about 30 countries so far signed up. We need more. Um, at the most recent UN General Assembly, the virtual one just a few weeks ago, over 75 world leaders and 50 non-state actors signed up to a leader's pledge for nature. And I think it is the most ambitious such declaration ever made, I would say by far. It was a commitment among many other things to putting nature and biodiversity on a road to recovery by 2030. And I'm proud that the UK strengthened that pledge line by line. A 2021, a year with all three Rio conventions meeting for the first time in the same year, is the year to make real those commitments. Protecting and restoring nature must be the golden thread that runs through all of them. And we're committed to doing everything we can to make sure that happens. It's no longer a choice, it's a duty. And your pioneering work is going to be critically important. So I thank you again, I wish you well, and I look forward to your report. And it's my pleasure now to hand over, I believe, to State Secretary Holson, who's joining us from Norway. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Lord Goldsmith, and thank you for your uh, in inspiring words. And, and the scientists who are uh, here uh, today are really uh, encouraged to see that their uh, work is really having uh, an impact and, and, and is being uh, used to inform uh, decision making. Thank you again. Uh, so indeed, uh, uh, it is uh, now my pleasure to invite State Secretary Holsen, uh, Ministry of Climate and Environment uh, of Norway. State Secretary Holsen, uh, we are delighted to have you and you have the floor. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and the opportunity to speak to this uh, event. I would also like to thank Lord Goldsmith for co-hosting this uh, workshop. It's a pleasure for me to open this um, with you. Um, the UK has over many years shown considerable leadership in respect of climate and biodiversity, and we are really encouraged by your effort to, uh, to campaign to champion nature-based solutions at COP26. Nature-based solution uh, should be at the center of attention both at COP15 in China and uh, at COP26 in Glasgow. I'm very pleased to virtually meet IPIS and IPCC experts gathered online today and thankful that you are all able to continue your important work through these difficult times. Uh, your diversity of expertise and knowledge will be a huge asset to this workshop. Norway is a strong support of both the EPCC and EPIS, and we are uh, and we welcome this collaboration between experts from the two panels and the panels themselves. The theme of this workshop is indeed very relevant and timely. We are facing a global climate crisis and a global biodiversity crisis. It's the time, uh, it is time that we all recognize that we cannot solve the threats of human induced climate change and loss of biodiversity in isolation. We either uh, solve both or we solve neither. Uh, policies, effort and actions are at very at every level will only succeed if they are based on the best knowledge and evidence. The knowledge assessments from IPCC and EPIS are enormously important um, in that regard. However, um, if we 
acknowledge that the solution to protect biodiversity and combat climate change go hand in hand, it is essential to also increase our understanding of the interlinkage between climate and biodiversity and the implication for human welfare. Develop, developing common terminology and methodology will be important to help us both to better better understand and address these um, interlinguages. Knowledge uh, are has a critical role when it comes to finding solutions, both on a global and a local level. Developing a common scientific basis has been a key for creating integrated ecosystem-based management plans for all Norwegian sea areas. These plans are developed jointly by all relevant sectors and provide a framework for sustainable use while also safeguarding the marine ecosystems. Through the process of developing management plans, we, are, uh, we have experienced that importance of having a knowledge knowledge base um, with legitimacy among everyone involved. Norway is also proud to be able to contribute to a strong knowledge base on oceans globally. The high-level panel for sustainable ocean economy, led by the President of Palau and the Norwegian Prime Minister, recently launched a report contain, uh, containing a transition agenda for a clean, healthy and productive ocean, drawing on the latest scientific research and analysis. Amongst many interesting findings, the panel's expert group demonstrated that ocean-based climate action could reduce the emission gap by up to 21% by 2050. This is equivalent to taking um, more than a billion cars off the road each year. Our knowledge uh, of the oceans are increasing, and with it, uh, and with it, our actions to safeguard the environment become more targeted. Unfortunately, global warming is creating an increased complex situations. One example, close to hard for Norwegians, is the Arctic. The Arctic is warming twice as fast as the rest of the globe. The rapid change is having disturbing impact on the environment and the biodiversity, such as ice-dependent mammals. More research, research is needed to understand the effort of the leakage of methane from melting permafrost ecosystem in Siberia uh, or from seabeds in Antarctic. Both the uncertainties and the risks connected to such findings should be clearly communicate, communicated to policymakers. I am convinced that the cross-disciplinary knowledge is a key in identifying the solutions we need. Participants in this workshop has an excellent starting point. I wish you all success with your work these days. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, State Secretary Holson, and uh, many thanks again for the support from Norway. Uh, it is now my uh, pleasure to deliver some remarks. On behalf of the IBES Chair, Anna Maria Hernandez, who unfortunately is unable to be uh, with us today. On her behalf, therefore, uh, I would like uh, to thank again uh, the United Kingdom and Norway for co-hosting uh, this uh, historic event and uh, both dignitaries for their uh, important uh, remarks. Uh, again, uh, their presence uh, underlines the, the significance uh, of, of this workshop, uh, which marks the first ever collaboration uh, formally uh, between IBES and IPCC. This, there is a lot of work uh, that is, of course, currently ongoing. This workshop will build on all of these works, in particular on work that IBES and IPCC have already uh, started to understand these complex connections uh, between uh, biodiversity and climate change. For example, the global assessment uh, of biodiversity and ecosystem services of IBES uh, in 2019 showed partly based on the work of uh, IPCC, 
how climate change is impacting biodiversity, causing shifts in species distributions, forwards, upward uh, in altitude, and having a major economic impacts. The global assessment uh, of IBES also concluded that nature-based solutions uh, can reduce the scale and impact of uh, climate change and at the same time provide benefits for uh, biodiversity and other sustainable development goals. The IBES plenary in 2019 requesting a scoping a report for a future assessment of IBES, which would start next year in 2021, and would look at the interlinkages between food, water, health, biodiversity in the context of climate change, <clears throat> an assessment which we refer to as the nexus uh, assessment. The outcome of this workshop this week, uh, the IBES IPCC co-sponsored workshop, will support uh, this uh, scoping uh, and also future work uh, of IBES. Similarly, uh, IBES organized a workshop on biodiversity and pandemics released at the end of October, a couple of months ago, and that a report will also uh, provide uh, materials for this future Nexus assessment. As has been said, next year in 2021, both COP15 of the Convention on Biological Diversity and COP26 of the United Nations Convention on Climate Change hosted by the UK will be held. We already know, based uh, on the IBES global assessment, that none of the 20 IG targets uh, will be reached this year in 2020 at the global level. COP15 will be invited to approve a new set of targets for 2030 as part of the post-2020 uh, global biodiversity framework, which is currently uh, being uh, designed and under consultation. It is therefore very timely uh, for IPCC and for IBES experts who are here today to address these linkages between biodiversity and ecosystem and climate change to inform the design of coherent policies to reach climate goals, thanks to and not at the expense of uh, biodiversity. I thank you for your attention. It is now uh, my pleasure to invite Professor He Sung Lee, Chair of IPCC, to deliver his opening remarks. He Sung, you have the floor. Excellencies, dear colleagues, thank you for the invitation to join you at this important meeting. I'm very grateful to the governments of the United Kingdom and Norway for co-hosting this workshop. I thank the IPBES and IPCC viewers, especially my colleagues from IPCC Working Group 2, uh, for their efforts to find the most productive ways of bringing biodiversity and climate change issues together. And I congratulate the Scientific Steering Committee for developing a comprehensive agenda and IPBES for the workshop organizational arrangements in these difficult times. Two days ago, we marked the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement. Many governments, as you know, announced ambitious climate action but we are still far from trajectories to be in line with the Paris Agreement. The recent reports from the WMO and UNEP reconfirm this. True, emissions dropped in 2020, but that was a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, not the result of climate action. And in any case, our assessment must consider data over a longer period, not just one year. COVID-19, its impacts and the responses will occupy scientists in many disciplines for the years to come. But as researchers investigate this global health emergency, they will also look at linkages with other planetary emergencies such as climate change and biodiversity. This co-sponsored workshop is therefore extremely timely as it brings together the two scientific community to probe the interactions between biodiversity and climate change. 
The IPCC participation in this co-sponsored workshop is consistent with the holistic approach pursued by the IPCC in this cycle of assessments, that is the sixth assessment report. It is urgent to bring biodiversity to the forefront of discussions regarding land and ocean-based climate mitigation and adaptation. The science community will benefit greatly from this workshop addressing the synergies and trade-offs between biodiversity protection and climate change mitigation and adaptation. We hope that this workshop will advance the knowledge about the impact of climate change on biodiversity, the capacity of species to adapt to climate change, the resilience of ecosystems on the climate change, and the contribution of ecosystems to climate feedback and mitigation. While the workshop report will not be an IPCC product, it will still constitute a valuable contribution to the IPCC Sixth Assessment Report. I wish you collegial and productive discussions in this workshop. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ho Sung. Uh, and finally, uh, to uh, close uh, this opening segment, I'm happy to give the floor to the two co-chairs of this uh, workshop who will chair the rest of the workshop, Professor Hans Otto Perkner from the Alfred Wegener Institute in Germany, co-chair of Working Group 2 of IPCC, and Professor Bob Scholes from the University of Witwatersrand, South Africa, and co-chair of the Ibisland Degradation and Restoration Assessment. Hans, you have the floor, followed by Bob. Thank you very much, uh, Anne. Excellencies, uh, dear colleagues, I'm honored to have been selected as co-chair of this major event, and I'm also honored to share this task with Bob Scholes. Climate change and biodiversity loss are in do, indeed two of the biggest challenges of the Anthropocene. At the same time, they are interconnected as we've already heard, as parts of the same complex problem, which is human interference with how the planet functions. And they are interdependent as climate influences biodiversity and vice versa. So from a scientific point of view, it is therefore key to bring climate and biodiversity together. It is beneficial to also bring them together at the political level and to design solution policies based on synergies between the two. Ultimately, and Lord Goldsmith has already emphasized this, human well-being depends on solving these issues. The scientific community has been working for a while now on the synergies and trade-offs between climate and biodiversity. As a synergy, for example, actions taken to protect biodiversity can simultaneously contribute to both the mitigation of climate change and increasing the capacity to adapt to those climate changes that cannot be avoided. In contrast, a negative trade-off can result if actions taken to use the land or oceans to mitigate climate change unintentionally result in the loss of biodiversity. Considering both aspects will provide science-based evidence to policy on solution options and on avoiding maladaptation where one issue may benefit at the expense of harming the other. Connecting climate and biodiversity becomes thus extremely important, particularly at this moment when signals indicate that the world is moving into taking stronger actions. Actions need to be taken in the right places. In light of urgency, there is also no time to lose. However, both climate and biodiversity are currently covered by different international agreements with their own underlying procedures and structures, including separate assessments by IPCC for climate and IPBES for biodiversity. This comes with the risk of ignoring important connections between the two issues. It is the nature of complex systems that they not only may have unexpected outcomes and thresholds, but also that you cannot manage the individual parts in isolation from one another. Accordingly, 
climate and biodiversity have to be considered together. And this is what the meeting and its report will be about. Thank you and over to Bob. Bob needs to be unmuted, please. Can yeah, um, Bob uh, Scholes unmute the now? Yes. yes, there Let's we go. Get started, yes. yes. Thank you very much, Hans Otto. I'm also honored to be selected as a co-chair of this workshop and really delighted to share that role with Hans Otto Potno. Like him and many of the other participants, I've worked on both sides of the climate and biodiversity fence. And I'm now especially enthusiastic about working to make sure that the fence in fact disappears and we have one seamless message. The scope of the workshop has been set by a science steering committee of 16 people selected from experienced, well-known leading experts from both domains from all around the world. And one of their tasks has been to identify and select the experts, you, who will participate in the workshop and author its report. Your selection was based on, firstly, your expertise. These are, you are all highly published, highly cited leaders in your fields. Secondly, we paid a lot of attention into the balance between world regions, between the North and the South, and the East and the West, between developing and less developed parts of the world. We also tried to balance research disciplines across the entire spectrum that we need to consider here, which is not just narrowly, um, you know, a climatology and biodiversity science, but covers, in fact, many domains. And we also are very pleased that we have a very good gender balance as well. Finally, many of you have expertise both in climate and biodiversity, and specifically on the interactions between the two. And many of you have served both in IPCC and IPBES, and so you understand the underlying logic and procedures and approaches used in scientific assessments. The, uh, the usual procedures which are applied by both IPCC and IPBES which are aimed at ensuring the reliability of the science applied to this workshop process as well. They have been modified in recognition that this is a workshop rather than an assessment and therefore does not have to have as many uh, open review loops, nor does it report to a plenary which then drafts a summary for policymakers. In our case, our science steering committee will act as the body which decides that the report that we produce meets the scope that was identified and satisfies the standards of balance, completeness, transparency, traceability and rigor associated with a workshop which informs assessments. The meeting report, which is finally due in April 2021, will provide a very important input into ongoing and future assessments by both IPCC and IPBES. This will then inform policy, providing science-based evidence and options how to develop solutions that keep both areas in mind and avoid mal maladaptation, where one issue may benefit at the expense of the other. This is particularly important within a context of risk management within an uncertain future environment. So I welcome you all uh, to this meeting. I'm in greatly uh, looking forward to getting down to the meat of it. Thank you very much, uh, Hans uh, and Bob. And I would really like uh, at this time to thank all of the uh, selected experts uh, who are uh, attending this opening segment. They are uh, volunteering their time and uh, ideas uh, for this workshop and indeed for all of the good work that is carried out uh, by both uh, IPCC and eBay. So many thanks uh, again to the experts. So um, with this, um, excellencies and dear uh, colleagues, uh, I believe that uh, we have come to the end of this uh, opening uh, segment. Many thanks again uh, to the minister, to the state uh, secretary, for their inspiring remarks today, for their support. 
many thanks to the chair of IPCC and to the co-chairs of, of the workshop. 